Hello folks and welcome back to Medieval Total War. I am Kana Step and this is going to be part 13 of my early campaign where I'm playing as the Danes. And we are at the point in this campaign where I do have, uh, well I have secured my Baltic Empire here. And I was making a bit of money. The Egyptians sort of thwarted my plans. I not making as much as I was. I'm making over two grand, which is, which is, you know, I'm in the positive, right? That is a-okay. But, yeah, I realize there's only one Egyptian boat in the waters right now. So I shouldn't be too afraid of them, right? But I just don't want to start wars with them, you know? Or I don't want them to start wars with me, more precisely. So... I'm going to be waiting until I have more of a, um, well, more of a presence, really, before I go back into these eastern waters here, and that's when I can go back to making some really good money. Um, I'm looking at, you know, I would like to go back to making, like, you know, over six grand, which would be the, the goal, I think, but for, for now, like, 2,000 is fine, my treasury is fine, I'm sitting on 161,000 florins in my treasury, so everything is fine, right? Well. Eh, not so much. In the east, well, I know the Mongols are coming, and the Turks, or the newly emerged Turks, well, they're not leaving me alone. They just attacked me last episode, and I wasn't really expecting it. I mean, I think they are already at war with other factions, I, I believe. Yeah, they are already at war with the Novgorods, and it's just like, okay, we'll focus on them. Like, why don't you, you know, like they have some pretty weak provinces, just focus on the Novgorods. But no, they attacked me here in Lithuania, and I, I did beat them, but now I fought two battles against the Turks that have me a little bit worried, because the Turks, in theory, are going to have some similar army comps to what the Mongols are going to uh, to put on on the, on the field against me and my army is not fair as well as I would have liked them to I it's it's kind of it's interesting because I have played against the Mongols before I feel rather confident in, in being able to fight them um even without having good spear units I for instance as the Byzantines you only you only get access to the basic spearmen the basic basic spearmen you know no feudal sergeants and nothing else. You can, of course, buy mercenaries, but the Byzantines are very, very hampered and limited to what they can do with their spears. Now, that was okay, though, because I, you know, it was spears along with some Byzantine infantry, along with some Orangian guard, and, of course, some supporting troops. I feel like that held very well. Now, my Byzantine campaign was not a good example of that because I just kind of beat the Mongols right away in my first battle. And I just killed the Mongol Khan just right away. So that's not like a good example of that. But I have played practice campaigns where, again, my Byzantine armies. And I'm not saying the basic spearmen were like the focal point of my Byzantine defense. But still, they felt like they were okay enough. And here I am playing the Danes. And again, I have, you know, played a Danish campaign as a practice up to, you know, defeating the Mongols. And... Here I'm in this campaign using Feudal Sergeants, which is an upgrade over base experiment. And I'm using some decent axe units. You know, I have my, for lack of a better um, terminology, I have my light axes, which are my Vikings. My mid axes are my medium axes, which are my, my Viking landsmen. And then I have my um, heavy axes, my Viking Huskals. Now I can no longer train my medium or my heavy axes, so I need to kind of save what I have for the Viking uh, fight or the Mongol fights. Um, but my axemen are not performing as well as I kind of thought they would. The fight, the matchup against the Saracens that the Turks have, the Saracen infantry, which is a spear unit, that really freaked me out. That got me a little bit rattled watching that unit beat my Viking landsmen. And again, I forgot to. Uh, do a matchup test before I started recording this episode. I do have a tool that I downloaded off of a forum that um, someone made, you know, decades ago that allows you to do matchups of all of the units in this game. Um, it's very useful. It's very fun to play around with just to kind of see who would win these fights. It, unfortunately, the tool does not take into account unit size, which, you know, is a big deal because unit sizes are different based on the weapon type. But still, it can give you a little bit of an idea 
of how the matchup will unfold before you fight it on the battlefield. So I forgot to do that test before I, you know, again started recording. Um, but heck, we saw it in battle, right? Like those Saracens really just demolished my landsmen. And that's a weird outcome for me. Like sure, there's other factors you can say. Uh, the Turks had a better general, I believe they did. Um, but that was, it was different. You know, you can also say that, yeah, some fighting on expert difficulty, that gives the enemy a bit of a buff as well. But still, the outcome of that battle was, I would say, more determined by that unit's stats more so than like, you know, AI stuff, like, you know, their, their general and um, the difficulty level. I feel like that was just a bad matchup for my access for some reason, you know? Now, you could say, look, clearly there's obviously better ways that I could have handled that. Um, I'm not saying I, you know, yes, I can figure that one out and play it better tactically, uh, get flanking attacks, use red formation. You know, I, I, I get that. I understand. But going into that battle, I did think that a head-on-head -head matchup that would not require too much babysitting would be my axes beating their spearmen. I thought that that was going to be a decisive victory for me, at least in that little local area on the battlefield. So the fact that that spearman, that spear unit demolished my axes so thoroughly has me a little bit shook. Now I want to remind myself that the Mongols do not have access to Saracen infantry. That is a Turkish and Egyptian unit. So that's good. <laughs> That's good. I understand that the Mongol infantry is its a hybrid unit. It's not bad in melee, but it's not a Saracen infantryman. You know, it's an archer unit that can scrap in melee. It's, it's a decent it's a decent fighter in melee, but I, I have to imagine, I have to think that my dedicated melee soldiers should be able to beat the Mongol hybrid, you know, archer infantry. I think they're just called Mongol warriors, I, th I think, maybe. Uh, I guess I'll find out, but I have to imagine that my dedicated melee infantry can beat their hybrid archers in combat. I have to imagine that, despite the fact that I have um, been somewhat broken, you know, in a melee, but in two straight battles by the Turks. The other concerning aspect of this was the fact that their hybrid cavalry and this is, I'm talking about the, the initial Turkish armies. These Turkish armies are a bit more beefed up. They do have some step heavy cav, which came along with the uh, reemergence faction. Um, this is not something that, I don't think they had this unit before. But like the Turkmen horse, you know, this is a hybrid cav unit, skirmish cav unit, that I thought performed pretty well in that first battle that I fought against the Turks. And again, that has me a bit worried because that's the unit that like, Mongols have a better version of this. I'm pretty sure the Mongol light cav is better than the Turkmen horse, I, I think. As a hybrid, you know, as a hybrid melee slash skirmish cav, I, I think that it is better than the Turkmen horse. And also the Mongols have like a, uh, like a heavy cav unit that's a archer and it's a, even better in melee. Anyway, that's just me saying that I'm a little bit shook. And I'm a little bit curious. I'm a little. Bit, I'm a little. I'm a little questioning of of you know what I'm going to have to do here to defend against the Mongols. Currently, I am training feudal sergeants here in Novgorod. I believe I just got that next building. Yes, now I I just got the ability to train chivalric sergeants. This is my third tier spearman. It's a good unit. It costs 100 florins more than the feudal sergeants, so 200 for the feudal sergeants, 300 for the chivalric sergeants. I believe the support cost is the same. 62 florins, yes it is. Now it's interesting, I have the stats for these two units pulled up on my laptop right now, so I can compare the two, and it's interesting, the, sh the feudal sergeants actually have one more attack than the chivalric sergeants, and the feudal sergeants also have two more morale. Morale. You know, they will hold longer, you know, essentially, than chivalric sergeants, which is curious. So what do chivalric sergeants bring to the table? Well, they have four more defense than a feudal sergeants. That's a lot. And then I believe they have two more uh, armor points, which also is, you know, it's good. Um, so it's it's probably still overall a better unit. I think morale is one of those things that... Um, 
you know, it obviously can be boosted by buildings and such. And you can boost these other stats as well. Um, what do I have here in Novgorod? I have a church. So the church is going to be giving plus one morale. So that can help a little bit. I also have an armor, which is giving plus one armor. I think I should keep trying to boost my soldiers here in Novgorod. I could build a armor's workshop for plus two armor, making my spearmen even more beefy. And I was wondering about the monastery. So the monastery is a building that, well, it's kind of like a secondary, secondary religious building. It is not the same uh, branch or like, tree as the church line I think it's it's a different thing the monastery is more like um it allows me to train inquisitors which is a different type of agent unit that's specific for catholic factions the inquisitor is kind of a funky unit it does some some different things that I might I might talk about later I might you know do a little bit dive dive a little bit more into inquisitors later on into this campaign right for for the purpose of this though there's this aspect of the monastery, which is confusing. It's that it offers plus one morale. Now, I've gone back and forth on thinking that this stacks with the mainline uh, religious buildings being the church, so that you can essentially get, you know, plus one morale from both the church and the monastery. But when I double check this on the, um, the Total War org wiki, it says that it, they don't stack. It says that some of the things stack, like the monastery will like help spread Catholic conversion and like happiness, and that will stack with the church, but the morale bonus does not stack with the church, which is confusing, and I don't you know, know if that's 100% true, but I'm gonna, we're just going to go off of what I'm reading right now. That's unfortunate, so that means that, you know, this isn't going to help my chivalric sergeants or feudal sergeants if I build a monastery here in Novgorod. In fact, there's probably no reason for me to build this here in Novgorod. Um, the Armorer's Guild is probably, the, or the Armorer's Workshop is probably the way to go. Now, morale is a kind of a funny thing, because for the longest time playing Shogun 1 and Medieval 1, I was under the impression that the Command Stars that the generals have uh, will also, I mean, being that command stars boost valor for the units that are under their command, and being that valor boosts morale and attack and defense, I would assume that generals command stars essentially, you know, boost the units uh, morale and attack and defense. It's been brought to my attention recently that, that that's probably not true. That seems to be that the Command Stars, that the Valor that's provided by the Command Stars just boost attack and defense, not morale. That's still a new thing for me. Like, even though I was told this probably like, you know, eight months ago or something, I'm still trying to get this across my head, you know, because I believed it the other way for so long. I believed that the Valor provided by these generals, Command Stars, was boosting morale. Um, now I, I tend to believe this information that was given to me because the source is, is a pretty, um, trustworthy source in the old, you know, forums from, you know, decades ago. Also, another reason why I tend to believe that this is true is because that would explain why we have these, um, these virtue traits that essentially give morale, like separately, right? Um, I don't know if this general has it. No, he does not. But we, we've seen plenty of these instances before where, where there's these uh, virtues that that boost morale. Or in this case, lower morale, right? Uh, minus three morale for being an unhinged loon. So, you, you know, that's not exactly evidence, but like it, it kind of points in the direction of like, the morale boost being a separate thing from the command star valor boost, right? Um, again, if you like have any, you know, proof or or uh, anecdotal experience with this, I would like to hear your opinions on it because it, again, it's it's still kind of new to me. Like I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because if you're trying to boost a unit's morale now, well, you need specifically a general with a morale boosting stat, or you need to train units and provinces with morale boosting buildings which themselves are a bit limited. I don't know what else, 
I can't remember, like, how many upgrades are there to a church? Just one other... I'd just be like... Two more upgrades, but then the like the top version of the church, like the like the top tier church, I think you can only build one instance of. Like you can only build like I think it's cathedral, and you can only build it once, I think. But then the second tier of the church, I, I believe, you know, obviously will give plus two morale. But again, I'm kind of kind of spitballing in my you know right now. I'm kind of don't have everything memorized, and I don't want to just spend this whole episode uh, reading off to you off my laptop, right? So I want to. <laughs> I want to get moving on eventually here. <laughs> anyway, so hopefully that's my rant for the episode. Um, so moving forward, obviously I do want to stop training feudal sergeants and just start training chivalric sergeants. And then let's go armor's workshop. It is tempting to get a mass or a merchant's guild so so I can get more money, but I think right now working on my military is going to be the better shout. Finland is still building boats. I am building the caravels, and this is my only province focusing on my navy right now, which means that my, you know, my progress down here will be a bit slower, which is unfortunate. I would like to get into these eastern sea regions a, a bit faster to make more money faster, but let's just hang tight. Let's hang tight and just kind of wait until I have maybe two or three boats to send into these regions just to make sure that when the Egyptians come out with more boats, they don't think it's a good idea to attack me. Yeah. That's going to be the idea up there. I do have another princess who has just come of age, so she can help scout these regions for me. They can go here, and Bishop can go here to Champagne. And yeah, I basically just, like, I'm just using my princesses as a temporary scouts until they retire um there's no one that i really need to use them to you know i don't need to marry them off into other royal families right now i have the alliances that i need which is with the french <laughs> and the papacy that's really all i care about and um and i you know if i need to use my princesses to marry them off to my own generals that might come into play later on my king is 47 and he does have the Magnificent Builder trait, which is giving plus two loyalty to all generals. So when he dies, all of my generals will lose to loyalty. Um, yeah, hopefully that doesn't cause any issues, but uh, if I have to, I do have three princesses who are currently st still around. I don't know how old they all are. 15, 18, and 25. So Princess Astrid probably won't still... Um, be suitable to marry off to a general by the time the king dies, but these other two probably will still still be available. Prince Sven is my um, next in line, and he's like, you know, shitty, but loyal enough, and he's fine enough. And I am working on trying to get him married. I do have my emissary down here who is trying to find him a bride. So far, the French did turn me down, which is unfortunate, but... I'm going to go talk to the Spanish princess right here and see if they want that. And there's there's other options. There's an Italian princess, Hungarian princess. You know, there's there's plenty of options. So we will see how that goes. All right. Finland, you can actually build a master merchant so I can make more money off you. A Novgrad, we've already covered. Livonia. Livonia is building a monastery. I'm basically like using Livonia as my agent province so yeah you can go back to training more uh bishops and you can i can actually send another bishop yeah let's just start working on the iberian peninsula why not and yeah you're going there uh lithuania do i want to train any more like shitty stuff like i can keep training woodsmen here which i have been doing but you know like it's nice to get woodsmen in lithuania with that plus one valor they're cheap. You know, they are. They are cheap. So, there's that. I don't know how worth it it is, though, you know? Ah, heck. You know, I, sh I, sh I should be training soldiers right now. I, I should be, right? Uh, Prussia, you can go back to training crossbows. Yes, definitely need as many crossbows as I can get out of Prussia. Pomerania is working on crossbows as well, and it's also building a church. Prussia is currently also working on building a castle here, so that I can eventually get... I'm trying to work on getting Arbalesters, which is the upgraded crossbow unit. 
I probably won't get them out in time to face the Mongols, though. Maybe. Well, maybe I will. I don't know. Seems like I'm halfway done with building the castle, so it seems like there's still going to be a bit of time left. Uh, Saxony, I, I still want Saxony to become a place where I can eventually train my feudal knights. Currently, I am training feudal knights here in Denmark. That feels good. Uh, it's good to have a good, you know, heavy cav unit that's available. But I would like to do that here in Saxony. And Saxony, I think, what's next for you? Yeah, I think you need a castle next. And Royal should I train Royal Knights just to get... Doesn't feel good, does it? You know, this is a 20-man unit of Heavy Cav, so not as good as the Feudal Knights, right? But it's still something, you know? And I'm sending pretty much like all of my Feudal Knights to my Eastern Provinces. Maybe just to have some Royal Knights for like my other provinces, just so that they can have some Heavy Cav. Maybe that would be nice, you know? Yeah, I think so. I Yeah, it's... Yeah, I think so. Up here in Sweden and Norway, I'm basically just using both of these provinces to double-team my training of my Vikings. Uh, since I can no longer train my Landsmen or my Huskarls, and I'm just kind of stuck on training my, my Light Axe unit, my Viking unit, I want to get them as sauce as I possibly can, right? So I'm using Norway to get that plus one Valor bonus. There's no buildings that I can build that will give Valor to Vikings. So I have to rely on this province itself to give the Valor. And then I'm bringing them on over to Sweden where they can be retrained with uh, weapon and armor upgrades. Of course, I do have an armor here in Norway, but like, you know, Sweden has the uh, iron deposits here. So yes, I do have the metalsmith. And then I'm working on my, um, this is my third tier armor guild yeah third tier armors building here in sweden and then the second tier metalsmiths workshop and then the uh, master merchant for some more money here in sweden as well so yeah and then norway i think is just building a citadel so i can get the master merchant there yeah that seems to be the way to go okay so that looks okay otherwise everything else in the world is pretty much just has it you know as it has been right france is just you know Facing off against everyone and kicking ass. The king has been excommunicated and it does not matter. The, the, the generals love him and he's, you know, he's he's not fighting the Almohads, but he's at war with Spain because this is a reemergence that took back Portugal off of him. And the French are also at war with the Italians. We're just hanging in here, right? They're just really, really just doing what they can. Bless their hearts. And the English have a foothold here in Flanders. But again, you know, they're just, they're struggling. And the French are also at war with the Hungarians. And that's like, honestly, based on the points that the Hungarians have, 86 points, I'm kind of okay with the Hungarians being knocked down a peg. But yeah, then again, we do have the Mongols that will be coming in from the east in due time. So all that's left for me to do this turn is to basically just kind of uh, retrain some of the units that were damaged in the last battle here in the against the Turks. And just sort of reorganize my armies to make sure my unit's in the right place. And then I can move on. And uh, yeah, the Mongols should be showing up again in the next few turns. Oh wow, so my emissary has escaped an assassination attempt here in Cordoba. Well, I'm lucky for that to have happened because he's my only emissary, I believe. And he has a very important mission right now, and that is to get my, my son a wife. So good job, Toke. Thorsteinson at Thorteen that assassin, yeah. Hmm, I wonder who was attacking me. The Almaheads? Alright, the Spanish king has died, but he does have an heir, which is good, because sometimes the reemergences um don't have like have a heir lined up right away, so that's good. Horse Breeders Guild. I think that in Denmark I was trying to work towards eventually getting chivalric knights at some point. It's such a good heavy cav unit. It's just, they're so, so good. So maybe that was the plan there. Uh, famine in Novgorod, that's not good. Income is going to be halved there. Novgorod's making a bit of money. All of my provinces are making a bit of money off of the trade. So uh, the Poles want to uh, be allies. Yes. Yes, I would really like that. I have no intention of attacking the Polish territories. So let's do that. In fact, I that should have been my idea. What was I thinking? Um... 
Is there anything? Let's see. Hard sums. Honorable warrior. Is that a general? Nothing. Looking for. So this is plus two morale. See, it seems like all of the guys that don't have command stars are getting decent traits. <laughs> And then my generals that do have command stars are like strange or unhinged, you know, it's just not fair. It's not fair, but you know what? At least the Turks did not attack me that turn, so. Huzzah for small victories. What the heck? What? The King of France has been killed in battle and he has no heirs and his forces have uh, degenerated into minor factions. That's it? The French are gone? <laughs> oh, wow. And one of my own heirs has matured, Prince Harold. Church finished. And the Germans reappear. Oh my god. They have 12 provinces joining the revolt. So, right, just just in like the corpse of the French Empire. The German Empire basically just takes over everything. And the Spanish king has accepted my proposal of a marriage. Awesome. So now my heir has been married. Let's see. Governor, master of numbers, plus three acumen. Awesome. That's a good one. Um, this Governor, minus four piety, but also plus four acumen for being a humanist. That's awesome. Let's see. This governor, often drunk. Not so good for that guy. Um, but then Prince Harold, he's a three-star general. That's good. Plus one acumen. That's good, but he's not going to be the king, so it doesn't matter. Great warrior, plus five health. That's fine. How's his loyalty? His loyalty is fine. He is perfectly acceptable. Awesome. And uh, he, he can be a general. I can put him somewhere, actually. I think he's better than some of the guys that I do have. Not this guy. This is my legendary peasant general, Lord Thordson. Yeah, no, there's no one better than you, sir, but... I mean, that's, that's a lie. There, there's someone better than you, but... The fact that I have a peasant general that's three stars, like, I'm never going to get rid of him. He's awesome. <laughs> um... These guys, though, like Prince Valdemar, you know, he's three stars, but he's unhinged. So, yeah, Prince Harold could probably replace him. And then also him, Sir Berger Thordson, also unhinged. So, that's not going to do. That's not going to do. I do have my four-star general that is being retrained. His unit is being retrained here. Um... I guess I can't look at his stats right now, but he will be leading the forces in Novgorod. And then my best general is this six-star feudal sergeant, Lord Sturluson. Who is a blackmailer, but his loyalty is fine despite that, which is good. And uh, highly educated, so yeah, uh, good. he's good. Six command stars is good. And um, no morale boosts, unfortunately, but he is the best, he's the best one that I have, you know? So honestly, yeah, I think that... Um, yeah, both of these guys are pretty bad, right? Is there, like, any difference between them? You have one Valor, and then... You have also one Valor. There's, like, no real difference, is there? I mean, you could be a governor at some point, because you have four acumen. You know, if I ever take another province. You, not so much. So... Let's bring you back or back and then let's put out Prince Harold yeah you can be leading my Pomeranian forces and down here is it is it every province that used to be owned by the French holy moly wow this is incredible so, you know, obviously a lot of wide open territory here that can be taken by m many different factions. The Germans have taken a lot of them, but not all of them. So, like, the Italians could take back uh, Milan, um, basically just Milan, unfortunately. The t you know, maybe Venice at some point, but this is, like, the old Italian forces, and these Italian infantry are good units. So, that's going to be a tough, 
stack to take on. As far as the rest of it though, yeah, the Germans are just, they're good, you know, they, they don't have everything. Like, they don't have Aquitaine, they don't have Brittany, they don't have Normandy, they have a lot of the central provinces, they don't have Champagne. The English were under siege here by the French here in Flanders, and they, they got saved. <laughs> So they still have that, and the English maybe can take Wales at some point? I don't know, these are decent armies, aren't they? Hmm. So I'm gonna go say hello to the Germans and go talk to them. It looks like the Germans will have a fight here in Bohemia. Yeah, basically two of their stacks versus two of the rebel stacks. But the Germans have some good units. Teutonic Sergeants? Hot damn. Wow. Yeah, Teutonic Sergeants are are decent units, I believe. Chivalric Sergeants and... So yeah, these are just all the units and the armies that used to belong to the French. And then these are the two re-emergence armies. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, let's go, all right, so let's make sure I take my bishop and let's talk to the king of the Germans. Oh, I can't do it this turn, okay. So I do have to wait until next turn before I can talk to the Germans. This also puts me in a very comfortable position regarding my glorious achievements because the French were the one faction that I was going to have to deal with at some point. Um, the Hungarians, despite the fact that they have this huge lead, I'm not too worried about them, just because I feel like they will be facing some pretty decent pressure from the east. And I think they will be stopped at some point. If I have to do it myself, I will, but like, I'm just not that worried about them. And then like, same thing with the other factions that are ahead of me, or close to me. Like the Italians, you know, we've seen them struggle, right? Like they're, they're struggling, they're in the pits. The Polish, again, like the Hungarians, they might, fa they might face some pressure from the east. Uh, rather soon so the French were the main faction that I was worried about just because they were you know they were good they were powerful they were big and even though their points weren't as high as the Hungarians it seemed it felt like they were gonna last a while you know uh, so that really kind of uh, calms me down a bit and makes me a bit more comfortable in that regard so who man that's a that's crazy wow that's huge man French king died with no heirs. Oh no. No, the Germans are attacking me. Oh. Gosh. Yeah, you're not gonna win. What were you thinking, you st stupid heads? You big old dummies? Damn. So the Germans took Venice, holy shit, damn. And the Mongols have arrived, yeah, right on right on 1230, the year 1230. So a vast horde of Mongol warriors has invaded from the east, intent on carving their, uh, out their own kingdom and adding it to the great Khanate that stretches all the way to Japan. They call themselves the Golden Horde. None are safe from this new threat. A number of other rebellions and progress have declared allegiance to this faction. A number of provinces being attacked as just one. So here in Khazar, they will be doing the dirty to the Novgorods. And, um, yeah, here they come. So it's just going to be a matter of time before they reach Lithuania if previous patterns hold true. And by patterns, I mean it just happened once. So that's not a pattern. We will see. We'll see if they attack me or if they want to go in a different direction. They, by taking Lithuania, I didn't leave them much of a avenue to, to not attack me, right? It's just kind of a narrow... A narrow section here being held by uh, Kiev. So it's like, it's either Kiev or Lith Lithuania, right? So, and they already border Kiev. You know, they're right there. So, yeah, it's, it's coming. All right, let's see. We caught a papal assassin here in Prussia. And the keep is now finished in Lithuania. Oh, boy. Okay. And, uh, yes, the Germans, I did try to get that alliance to the Germans, but I couldn't, couldn't make it work, I guess. Uh, yes. Germans, goddamn. I was really excited about you guys. <laughs> we were really good friends before, Germany. 
And uh, yeah, I did try to get a ceasefire with the Turks as well. And again, they don't want it. We will see about that. We will see about that. Uh, let's see. Prince Harold. Loyal. Good. Plus one loyalty. I'll take it. Yes, I will take it. Um, so can we get like a ceasefire with the Germans? Like, <laughs> I really don't want this war. How's my income now? Making four grand. That's okay. But, like, what ports do the Germans have that I'm not trading with? Um, these are all rebel ports. So I, I think I'm at war with these factions, right? Neutral. Oh, I am neutral with them. Oh, I got a ceasefire with the rebels because I don't border any of them. Nice. So I do, yes. So that means I'm trading with these provinces. Okay. Hmm. Well, s screw Germany taking these provinces then. Um, gosh, do they have any ports? I mean, they will have Venice soon. And then there's no port here in Friesland, is there? No. Huh. Well, I feel like I'm fine. I, I just had trained the, those royal knights here in Saxony as well, so that was perfect timing. Yeah, that was that was pretty slick. Not that that was the entire reason why they didn't go through with the attack, but it may have been part of it. Yeah, man, why would they why would they do that? Why would they attack me? Ooh, they got Swiss halberdiers as well. God damn. That's a good polearm unit. I don't think I've ever seen those before, honestly. Huh. So the Germans are causing some trouble, man. All right, this campaign is about to get very interesting. Yes, yeah, so I have to make sure that Lithuania is ready to go. How many stacks do they have here? Uh, a million? Okay, yeah, they have a million stacks. Let's do this. Since we are allies with the Poles, do we have any Huskarls here in Prussia? If we do, then let's get rid of them and bring them to Lithuania. Boom, boom, boom. You go. And then you, and then you also go. So yeah, that's six units of Huskarls. All of them with attack and armor upgrades. Some of them only have the armor upgrades, but still, that's, that's, that's heavy metal right there. That is some heavy metal shit. So let's bring over these three crossbows as well. Yes. And do I bring over more? Feudal Knights, we can hang out on that for a second. Um, let's start building my defenses here. So get a curtain wall, which is going to be like a stone outer wall for my keep, which will, it's, it's something, you know, it's, it's not much, but it's something. And to replace those Huskarls that I just took from Prussia, I can bring down some Vikings from Sweden. I'm at peace with the Poles, so, you know, we should be fine, theoretically. And let's go back to training, um, yeah, more crossbows here in Pomerania. These crossbows can stay there. And then Saxony, you're still training the Royal Knights? Yeah, that's fine. Because I want those units to be in these three provinces anyway. And then all of my feudal knights will be going to Lithuania and Novgorod. As to be expected, the people of Novgorod, or the people here in Khazar, have retreated from the Mongol Horde. I don't know if they've left anyone behind in that keep. That I don't know if they've done that. The Byzantines are happy just hanging out here in Crete and Cyprus. Yeah, why, why wouldn't they not be happy? Uh, let's see, the Sicilian king has died, but his heir has taken over. Monastery finished here in Livonia. I actually just remembered why I built the monastery there. Sure, it'd be nice to train... Inquisitors at some point, but really it's just because Livonia has the like it's one of those provinces that deals with loyalty issues, like um Scotland and Portugal. In fact, it's one of like the worst provinces, I think. It's like yeah, I looked it up somewhere, but it's it's bad. And I was having trouble with keeping it like I wanted to tax it, you know. And uh loyalty I could only like get taxes up to like high instead of very high because of the loyalty issues. And then I was looking at uh, buildings that increase happiness and the monastery popped up. So yeah, there's, there's options with that. That's the nice thing about this game is that there is options 
with the buildings that increase happiness. Like Shogun 1 didn't have a lot of those. Um, but in this game, there's quite a few, you know, like the like the town watch and the church and the monastery. Um, as I said before, at the beginning of this episode, the monastery and church happiness bonuses do stack, I believe, is, is what my sources tell me. So there's options. Although I, also, I think the brothel increases happiness. It's either the brothel or the alehouse, which is just kind of like random, but kind of like, you know, common sense. Like you kind of like, you just go along with it. It's kind of cool though. You know, like a building that you use to train agents. Um, you can also just use to boost your happiness. So yeah, that's why I did that there in Livonia. And let's see this governor plus one loyalty. Yep. I'll take it. And, and none of these guys are starred generals. So it doesn't matter. No, nope. nope, nope, nope. So yes, now they've taken Kazar like undisputed, right? And yeah, they have these Mongol heavy cav. These guys are just heavy cav. They are not archers. Their Khan is a three-star general. And let's see, then they have, oops, um, Mongol horse archers. These are their hybrid, you know, like horse archer units. Then the Mongol warriors, mo uh, hybrid archer and swordsmen. Natha throwers, so they have grenades. Sepcav, just like the, you know, basic light cav unit that's available here in these eastern steppe provinces. They're they're good units, they are, they are, so. Let's see, anything else? Any other cool units to show you guys? Um, oh, I'm not seeing any of the step. Oh, they have a mortar. Holy shit. Huh. Huh. I don't think I've... Yeah, they have a couple mortars in their armies. I don't know if I've ever noticed that before. Interesting. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so a lot of a lot of good stuff, but now let's see which direction they go. I realized to my dismay, or I don't know, I don't know if this is to my, to my dismay or not, but uh, between Kazar and Kiev, there's a river, right? So this would be a river battle if they attacked Kiev. Um, this would not be a river battle if they attacked Paraslavl. This would be a river battle if they attacked uh, Chernigov. And Ryazan would also be a river battle, and Volga Bulgaria would not be. So they, there's there's some rivers out, out here causing some issues for them, and that could make Kiev a tougher target for them, which might be okay. I don't know if that's good good or not. Um, obviously Kiev borders me, but they're they're gonna go in my direction anyway, you know. But. If they don't attack Kiev, then it's going to give me a couple more turns as they have to go like through a couple more provinces to get to me. You know, like either through here or through here or through here. Um, you know, if they avoid Kiev, I, I get a couple more turns, I think, is what I'm trying to say here. So let's bring down... I have three chivalric sergeants. Okay, I'll take it. Let's bring them down and let's keep training chivalric sergeants. Yes. Ho oh, ho ho. Okay, so the Mongols did go right in and uh, looks like they took Kiev without much issue. The Turks have retreated from Kiev. Okay. Let's see. It looks like a Dao was sunk here in the Gulf of Gabes. Uh, that's not one of my boats, so that's good. And, um,. Castles finished here in Prussia. Armors workshop is finished here in Novgorod. That's good. Keep in Britain Wall. This is the defensive upgrade. Here in Lithuania, now we can build ballista towers. Um, let's see. England is proposing uh, an alliance, actually. They're trying to marry one of their princesses to my son, Prince Harold, which I actually was... I'm okay with. I was actually trying to find a wife for him anyway. Um... By accepting the offer from the English, that means I'm accepting an alliance with them, which I'm also okay with for now. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's get a let's get a wife for Prince Harold, you know, just in case. Uh Prince Valdemar, captivating nature. So this is like one of the guys that's unhinged, I believe, but now 
he's also giving plus two morale, while also while still giving minus three morale. You know, so he's he's trying to make up for being a being a crazy dude in his younger years. Uh, Lord Sterlison plus ten happiness, nice. Okay, and Lord Gudritson builder plus ten happiness as well. And any other? Is there any starred generals getting? Traits. It doesn't seem like it. All right. So now the Mongols are on my border, and the Turkish garrison is only going to last for two turns here in Kiev. And now the question becomes: Where will the Mongols strike next? Will they go for Moldovia, which is being held by the uh, Hungarians? Will they go for Volhynia, which is being held by the Poles? Or will they go for? Um, you know, would they even go for Paraslavl, held by the Turks, or Trenigov, held by the Novgorods? You know, like, they really are in a central position. Or even Crimea, which is also held by the Turks. Like, Kiev borders a lot of stuff, right? And you would think, logically, they would not attack me because I have the most stuff. But I do tend to believe that the AI will kind of hone in on the human player in these situations. So, um... Yeah, <laughs> uh, we will see. Yeah, the question is, will they finish off this siege first before they attack? Or would they leave some armies to continue this siege while they send the other like four or five stacks to attack? Would they do that? That is the question. And that is the question that I'm not going to be able to find out in this episode. I feel like I'm cutting this episode a little bit short here, but I know that these... Fights against the Mongols can be very, very long. They're very long fights. And it's something that I kind of want to start at the beginning of an episode so that I have that entire episode to fight that battle. And basically, that's just all I would do for that episode is I would just fight that one battle and then just move on. Regardless of how much footage I get from that episode or not, it doesn't really matter. I can't fight more than one Mongol battle at a time. They're exhausting. They're very long. And uh, they would make the episodes go on too long. So I just, I can't risk it. For now, I have to cut it off here just in case they do move on and attack. Yeah. Yeah, so a bit of a cliffhanger here, but the Mongols have arrived. The French have fallen. The Germans have taken their place and they have right away made some enemies. So I have sent a princess to try to get a ceasefire with the German emperor. Hopefully she can achieve her mission. Um, and hopefully the Mongols attack in a different direction and not me. You know, go after the Hungarians. Is this a river battle? It is not. Yeah, go after Moldavia. Do it. Do it. <laughs> anyway, that is going to be it for this episode. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this one. And thank you very much for watching. This has been Connacep playing Medieval Total War. Thank you very much and goodbye.